Hi, everybody. Welcome back to MTED 110. Uh, today, we're going to be doing Lecture 10A, starting Chapter 10 and doing Lecture 10A. So let's get started. All right. Um, one thing I want to do here is give a little bit of a warning that this is going to be a particularly long lecture, just because uh, we have a lot of stuff to cover in this lecture. The, the next lecture shouldn't be as long. And actually, it's, uh, it's uh, probably going to be my favorite one because I've been trying to get these number visualizations to work for a few years now, and I was just able to do it this semester. So I'm really excited about Lecture 10B. Um, this Lecture 10A is going to be all about negative numbers. Uh, so actually, we'll just go ahead and get started right here. You might have noticed uh, so far that we haven't even talked about negative numbers yet. Um, as in like in this course, we've seen students use them in the videos, but we haven't talked about them. So now we're going to talk about them right now. Um, so one thing to keep in mind is this, uh, students have difficulty when they first learn about negative numbers. So this is from the book and it says, as with the rational numbers, the advent of integers broadens the domain of children's mathematical worlds and presents conceptual difficulties. Uh, in their early experiences with numbers, um, zero is thought of as representing nothing, but now suddenly there are numbers that are less than zero and adding them makes them quote unquote smaller because you go down in the line, right? So you have to, again, you have to kind of like check your bias and remember these are children who've never thought about these ideas before. So even though negative numbers might be quote unquote natural to us uh, as adults, it's not to children and um, uh, they're, they're going to struggle with it. So we have to be able to meet them where they're at. Um, yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Negative numbers are weird for, for young learners. It's, uh, it's not so straightforward. Um, positive and negative numbers are sometimes called signed, signed numbers <laughs> because of the plus sign uh, for positive numbers and the negative sign for negative numbers. Not too surprising. Um, this is a notation that you'll see in the book and on WebAssign and you'll use in your own classrooms. Sometimes we'll symbolize positive numbers as this little plus two, but the plus is like an exponent in the front. Um, and negative numbers is the same, except now it's a like a, a raised negative number or negative sign in the front. Um, usually we won't use the the plus unless we're trying to emphasize it. It just uh, just depends on the context, right? Um, but this notation here with the the little raised negative, that's there because we want students to view negative two as a number. Um, we don't want them to associate an operation with it per se. So we want them to really think of negative numbers as objects, the same way they were thinking of positive numbers as objects, right? We were talking about numbers and ways of representing them. Well, now we have negative numbers and we have symbols to represent them here. So that's why we would raise the negative and kind of like write it, a, you know, maybe write it a little shorter. Um, yeah, so after all, negative two is a quantity but we use an operator to indicate its sign. So that can actually be really confusing to students because we're trying to emphasize what these operators are and we're trying to emphasize what these numbers are. And now suddenly you're saying that a number just has an operator attached to it. And so it's like, like what's going on? Too many things trying to like, you know, stick together. So we have to kind of uh, be careful that they don't knit those things together. Um, so actually here's a quick question. Why do you think we write negative two this way? When, negative, when that little negative sign indicates the operation of, of subtraction, why do you think? Let me, uh, let me put up a thinker here for a moment. Well, not too surprisingly, it's because negative two is zero minus two, which is just equal to negative two again. So um, this is kind of where that uh, operational symbol comes into play, that you use zero as the, almost like a pivot point, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so it's conceptually different to think about a negative number than to think about the operation of subtraction. So we need to emphasize to our students that they're not the same thing. Negative numbers are still numbers. Um, and the number line is an excellent model for talking about negative numbers. We're going to see, uh, we're going to see an example later um, when we look at the, some different models for these. Um, and for now, what we're going to do is we're just going to restrict ourselves to opposites of whole numbers with these examples. But all of this stuff that we're talking about extends to any number, any real number. <clears throat> okay, so first we need to define uh, the set called the integers. So the integers are basically the positive and negative whole numbers. It's this set right here. Uh, it's an infinite set, meaning that there are infinitely many numbers in it, right? You've got all of the positive numbers, uh, all the positive whole numbers, and then you've got all of the negative whole numbers. So there's infinitely many of them. 
Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to uh, talk a little bit more about number systems in the next lecture, but uh, this is the set of integers and this is the next set of numbers that students are kind of introduced to. Although I would say that uh, they, they, they see fractions, so they get, to, they get to play around with rational numbers. But this is kind of around the same time, right around like fifth, sixth, seventh grade. Uh, okay, so some definitions. Uh, you don't necessarily have to memorize these. Um, at some point, you'll be using them often in later courses. But the numbers A and negative A are called opposites, or we call them additive inverses of each other. Um, th the reason they're called additive inverses is because if you take A and you add its inverse, it gives you zero, right? So that's a, that's a special property of numbers. If I give you any number at all, the opposite of that number is the number where if I add the two together, I get nothing, right? So that's why they're called additive inverses. Um, and the number zero is called the additive identity because zero is actually a pretty special number. It's the only number where if you add it to any other number, you just get that other number back. That's why we call it the identity. Let me give you an example here. This is going to seem kind of trivial, but this is what I mean. Um, two plus zero equals two. So what I'm saying here is that uh, this number here and this number, let me get a different color here. This number zero is the only number that behaves that way. So if you take zero and add it to anything, you just get that number back again. You don't, zero, it's like zero has no effect. That's why we call it the identity because it basically identifies that same number. Um, yeah, and this is actually how, uh, this is actually kind of how we define zero as it turns out. We define zero as the unique number that does that, the unique number that if you add it to any other number, you just get that number back again. So that's one of the ways we define zero. Um, so let's talk about this. Uh, we have to be a little bit careful with the way, uh, the words that we use. So I want you to just ponder this for a minute. Uh, take a moment to think about this. Okay, now take a moment to say out loud what you were thinking, just anything that you were thinking at all. And remember, you can talk to the wall, your dog, your cat, yourself, it, it's all right. Just say something out loud. Okay, so now let's talk about this together. Uh, what is the opposite of two? Well, I mean, I think we all could figure out that that's going to be this symbol right here. That would be the opposite of two. But the question is why, why is that the opposite of two? And the answer is that if I take two and I add negative two, then I get zero. So that's what it means to be the opposite of a number. If you add it to its inverse, then you get zero. Or I'm sorry, if you add it to that number, then you get zero. So what's the opposite of negative two? Well, you might've said two, right? But why, why is that the case? Because if we, uh, if we look at this, two plus, negative two is equal to zero. This is the same thing that's written above, right? But th this is a unique number. So these two numbers are additive inverses of each other. And those are, those are the two numbers that pair up like that to give you zero. So the opposite of negative two is two because when I add them together, I get zero. So that's really what it means to, to be an opposite. That if you pair those two things up by, by addition, you get zero. That's the idea. Uh, what's the opposite of the number zero? Well. Uh, it's going to be zero again, because if I do zero plus negative zero, I get zero. So zero's opposite is itself. It's actually the only number that's like that. Zero is the only number that's equal to its opposite. Um, now, this is, a, this is a big question right here. This is a good one. Is the opposite of A always a negative number? Hmm. What did you think? The answer is no here. The answer is no because uh, opposites don't have to be negative. And this is actually one of the confusing aspects of teaching these numbers to, or teaching these numbers to children. Because you have to be careful when you're saying negative and positive and opposite and inverse, because they can get confused. Uh, here, here's, the, here's, an, here's an idea, or here's a, an example. Let's say A is three, let's go with three. There we go. So negative three is negative, right? So this is actually a negative number. It's less than zero. But what if A is like negative four itself? Then we would have this, negative A is negative negative four, which is four, which is greater than zero. 
So in this situation, this symbol is representing a positive number. So it's uh, hazardous to say negative A, positive A, because uh, some of the, sometimes it's not going to be negative, sometimes it's not going to be positive. That's the idea. I think I talk about that on the next slide. Uh, let's look at this last one. What is 5 minus the opposite of negative 2? Well, if you say it out loud like that, it becomes quite clear, right? 5 minus the opposite of negative 2. Well, the opposite of negative 2, or maybe even saying the opposite of the opposite of 2, is 2. So this is just equal to 5 minus 2, right? What is the opposite of the opposite of 2? OK, the opposite of 2 is this. And then the opposite of that would be that. That's the idea. So what's 5 take away 2? Well, we know how to do subtraction. So this is just going to be 3. And there we go. That's the idea. So that's the reasoning that we have to explain to students when they first learn about negative numbers and how to operate on them. That's the idea. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is just what I was saying on the previous slide here. You want to be cautious because this symbol can be read as negative A or the opposite of A or the additive inverse of A. And then I think I gave it away already. Yeah, uh, which is accurate and which will cause the students the least, uh, which will confuse the students the least. And uh, it's this one. You should read it as the opposite of A or the additive inverse of A in those early stages when they're first learning about it. Um, because this number can be positive or negative. That's the idea. Now, uh, usually the context will clear these distinctions up. Uh, like, for example, uh, as adults doing this type of math, we can keep clear what we mean when we say negative A, positive A, that kind of thing. Um, but that only works if we understand the context, right? <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, so in later courses, we all understand the context. Um, but if a student doesn't, it can be very confusing at an early age, right? OK. Um, all right, so now let's talk about the number line, because the number line is really, really handy to talk about negative numbers, as you might uh, might have might have guessed, right? So uh, students have been using these for a while at this point, up into like fifth, sixth grade. And what we want to do is we just want to extend that model. That's one of the nice things about all of these models we've been learning is that you can extend them in meaningful ways. It's not like you have to start from scratch and think of a whole new model to explain it. It just keeps like working no matter what number you're using. Uh, yeah, so for example, this will be a basic number line here. Uh, positive 2 on the number line is 2 units to the right of 0, and the opposite of 2 is 2 units to the left of 0. So this is exactly the type of image that you're all probably thinking of, right? Here's 0, 1, 2. I'll use the positives right here. There we go. Oop. And then this would be like negative 1, negative 2, right? So what we're just saying here is that positive 2 is 2 units to the right, and the opposite of 2 is 2 units to the left. That's the idea, right? OK. Um, so this is the thing. Order is easily confused when negative numbers are introduced because the order is flipped, right? So you ever know, did you notice how like it's going down negatively? Or I should say it's going up negatively as you go this way, right? But over here, it goes up. Do, do, do. So when students are first introduced to this, sometimes it's confusing because they're like, wait, isn't it supposed to count the other way, right? It, I mean, it's always been one, two, three, four. Uh, one way you can do that is to, uh, one way I like to do it is to um, imagine uh, an arm, right? So if, uh, let's see if I can do this right with the camera. Okay, here we go, wait. All right, so imagine like uh, my arm is currently pointing in the, in the positive direction, right? And it goes one, two, three, four, five, six. It increases like that. Well, if I swing my arm around this way, it's still going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. But now it's going to be going the other direction. So it's going to increase going to the left, right? OK, <laughs> the left, <laughs> correct? So um, yeah, so that's something that you have to keep in mind, that students get confused about that initially. And that issue usually lies in understanding what's called the magnitude of the number or the absolute value of the number. Notice that uh, we're talking about distance away from the origin here. That's really the only difference between a number and its opposite. They're the same distance away from the origin, but they have an opposite sign. That's the idea. Um, one way to clear this up is to introduce the notion of debt or being worse off. Uh, teachers will use a lot of uh, problems involving money. This is also a good way to teach students about how to use money or how to, uh, uh, how to pay things with money or how to spend money. And you can talk about breaking dollars into quarters and all that type of stuff. Actually, um, I'm pretty sure that 
uh, toy theater has a, an emulator for that too. Pretty sure they do. I saw one. Uh, yeah, I think I saw one in a previous lecture. Okay. Um, oh yeah, so first and foremost, we need to help children make sense of sign numbers. So forget about algebra uh, and instead think about quantities, sizes, and models. Same thing we've been doing for a while, right? Um, there's at least three productive ways to reason about sign numbers that we'll talk about here. One is motion on the number line, moving left or right. Two is treating negative numbers like positive numbers and then operating on them. And then three is determining the sign of a, of a result before calculating the result. Kind of saying like, oh, well, because of the size of these numbers, I know that this is going to be a negative result. And then you, it'll help you work with the numbers. So those are the three we're going to talk about. Um, let's start with motion on the number line. Because children know so much about the number line, this is a model that's really nice to extend. So here's an example from the book. Violet, a second grader, was given a number line with the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 already drawn on it. When asked to solve negative 5 plus 2, she wrote the number 8 and filled in the number line as shown below. So she basically did this. Yeah, you can kind of see the difference down here. She wrote that in. Eh, let me use a different color. She wrote this in uh, and then filled in the number line as shown below. So she also came in and wrote these, right? So a couple things to notice about this. One, uh, she correctly ordered the negative numbers. So she's aware that they increase negatively that way. So that's a good thing. Um, she also used the idea that addition is moving right. Right, so this is something that we talked about way back in chapter three, actually, that addition is moving to the right on the number line. Um, yeah, there we go. Uh, and then so given this problem, she solved it in a similar way, right? Five minus eight, well, you would start at five and then you take away eight. She might've counted this way to get to negative three. Uh, yeah, there you go, by starting at five and moving to the left eight spaces. However, she found this problem to be more difficult because the starting point is not given to her. So this is interesting because she's still trying to figure out exactly where these numbers are and what this problem is actually asking her to solve. So this is a missing a missing add end problem, right? It's missing one of the terms of the sum. But uh, what she did, oops, there we go. What she did was she started by making a guess that negative five was the right answer and then realized that that couldn't be right because that will just cancel out to zero. So then she started to use trial and error. So she probably went uh, like so. She probably went negative four and then realized that was one and then negative two and then realized that was, that was, or sorry, <laughs> yeah, negative four and realized that was one and then negative two and then realized that was, and so on. That's what she did. Um, so what I want you to do at home is uh, I'll, I'll do, I'll do one of these, but then I want you to try some of these too. Hmm. Let's do four minus nine. Let's model that. Okay. So if I'm going to do four minus nine, let me write the problem up. 4 minus 9. I'm going to need a number line that has 9 on it. Or I'm sorry, has 4 on it. And, and I'm going to have to fill in some spaces below 0. So I think what I'm going to do here is mark 0 first. 4, 5. I'll put another one up. Uh, if you're going to use an arrow, uh, put an arrow just going to the right to indicate that that's the positive direction. Uh, same thing if you're drawing two, like two axes, like an XY plane or whatever, the arrow should point in the positive direction. That's the idea. Okay, so then I'm going to put some other numbers down here. And in the beginning, you should almost always draw zero if you can, just to give students a sense of where that is, right? Just where is that exactly? We do negative six here. Okay, so then I'm going to do four and then take away nine. So what I'll do here is I'll start at four. And then I'm going to take away 9. So I'll count in my head. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then I'll draw my arrow. Take away 9. And we end up at negative 5. So I would say 4 minus 9 equals negative 5. There we go. So that's how you would model it on the number line. Not too bad, right? Um, notice it's really, really clear for students as long as you've introduced them to the number line earlier. Okay, let's see. Um, I think I'm going to leave these other ones for you. So yeah, let me go ahead and put up a, a thinker and a writer here. So I want you to try to do these problems on your own. Just draw a couple of the number lines and uh, make sure that this makes sense to you, all right?
Okay. Now, uh, here's the other way that they can work with negative numbers. They can treat them like positive numbers and then think about the sign. So in the early years, children spend most of their time dealing with the natural numbers. Um, and for children, we usually start the natural numbers at one. They're the counting numbers, right? One, two, three, four. Those are the, the natural numbers to children. And they spend a lot of time working with those. So what we can do is we can extend that knowledge to help them understand negative numbers. Um, uh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, so this is an interesting example. Uh, first grader Jacob was being taught a little bit about negative numbers. And, oh, one second, my computer is about to die. Oh, is it not plugged in? Hold on. Ah, there we go. Now it's plugged in. Sorry about that. Um, so first grader Jacob said negative 5 plus negative 3 is just like 5 plus 3. 5 plus 3 equals 8, so negative 5 plus negative 3 is negative 8. Ah, that's clever, right? Is that actually valid? That's the question. Let's see. Um, here's another example. Uh, he was given this problem, negative 6 plus blank equals negative 9. So Jacob counted 6 cubes, for example, right? Um, and then he answered negative 3. So he explained if you're doing it with natural numbers, he didn't call them natural numbers, but he said if you're doing it with natural numbers, it's like 6 plus 3 equals 9. So I added the natural numbers, and then the negative numbers are like them because you just add a minus sign. Add a minus sign. Hmm. What does he really mean when he says add a minus sign? It's not exactly what's going on, right? <clears throat> um, then he did the same thing for this problem. Negative 7 take away blank. <laughs> negative 7 take away blank equals negative 5. And he said uh, he needed little cubes again. And he said it would be just like the natural numbers. And you just add the minus sign. You do 7 minus 2, and that equals 5, so it's got to be negative. So at the end, he says, I just added a negative to all of them, and there's my answer, negative 2. Negative 2, right? Interesting. So this seems to be working, and he's making a lot of sense of it because he's like, oh, let's just pretend they're positive and then change the sign at the end, right? So the question is, is that valid? And what I want you to do at home is I want you to try to use his way of reasoning about these and see if, uh, see if it always works. Um, I'll do the first one with y'all too. So let's see, for number one here, what he would do is he would say, hmm, I can just treat them like positives. So really we're doing nine minus two, and this would be like his scratch work, right? His scratch work would be nine minus two equals seven. So negative nine minus negative two is negative seven. So that would be his answer. And is that correct? Hmm, what do you think? Negative nine, minus negative two. I bet a lot of you are thinking like, oh, well, if you subtract a negative, then it's the same as adding. So it's negative nine plus two. But why? Why is that the case? That's interesting. Who says? Who says that that just suddenly becomes addition, right? Yeah, we're going to talk about that later in this lecture. Uh, but yeah, so go ahead and try the other ones on your own. Let me clear this one off right here. But yeah, try to do a two, three, four, and five, and then ask if there are anywhere his reasoning doesn't work. All right, so let's explore. Hopefully you went through a couple of these. And the one that we're most interested in afterward is this last one right here, three plus negative five. So if you tried this one out, you would see that his method does not work because he would say, oh, uh, just treat them all like positives and it would be three plus five equals eight. And then he would say the answer is negative eight. But that's not correct, right? That's definitely not correct. Three plus negative five is not negative eight. So why didn't it work for him in that case? Well, it's kind of a it's kind of interesting to explain. Oh, that's the next one. Uh, but uh, let's let's rely on some a little bit more advanced understanding that we have. What was he doing for this one? Actually, let me highlight that with pink. So with this one, he was essentially pretending they were positive and then adding the negative at the end. So mathematically speaking, what does that really mean? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm gonna look at negative nine minus negative two. Now, mathematically, what he's doing is he's factoring out a negative one and then applying the negative one after he does the addition or subtraction. So what he's really doing is this. He's going nine plus two, uh, sorry, uh, where's, uh, oh, sorry, negative two. 
you write it like this, nine plus negative two. And then he's doing that computation because that's just nine minus two, and that's where he gets negative seven. So mathematically speaking, this is what validates that reasoning. So that does actually work. That method is valid, but, but he's not aware that he's doing the distributive property or that he's factoring, right? Because that's not something that's been made clear. Uh, and the reason it doesn't work down here is because you would have to factor out a negative from the three also. So that's why that, that answer didn't come out correctly. Watch this. If I instead treat it like so, This is wrong, that's why I'm writing it in red. That was his reasoning right there. But in order to make this true, you would have to have a negative right there. You would need to include, actually I should, uh, there we go. You would need to include this negative right here to make that true. And then it would actually work because what are you gonna get? Now you would get five minus three, which is two, and then you would get negative two and that's actually the correct answer, right? Right? I think that's right. <laughs> Sometimes I, I lose it as, I, as I'm going through all of these little symbols and moving the symbols around, but um, yeah, negative two. So that's what you have to be careful here. So that method isn't always valid. So even though he might be able to use it, you have to caution him as he proceeds. He can use that as long as the numbers have the same sign. That's really the key. If these numbers have the same sign, then his method will work every single time. Okay. So middle and high school students will sometimes take account of the operation and the relative size of the result before calculating. So let's see an example of that. When solving six plus blank equals four, Angel wrote negative two and said six plus a positive number can't be four, so it has to be a negative number, right? Smart thinking, right? So she's like, okay, if I'm starting at six and I'm going down to four, but I'm adding, then I have to be adding something negative. It's the only way that I can make sure that I go down, right? Adding a negative to get me going down the right way. So that's how she figured that out. Um, when solving a problem like this, a student's reasoning went, well, since I'm subtracting, but the answer eight is larger than what I'm subtracting from five, I must be subtracting a negative number. So they figured this was, uh, what is it? Uh, five minus negative three, there we go. So that's the idea. That's how they would figure that out. Okay, so you try. So I'm gonna go ahead and give a, give a little thinking, thinking moment here and you try it. All right, let's move on here. So, okay, so now we're gonna explore a couple of models. We've seen the number line model, but we're going to explore it a little more in a little more detail. And then we're gonna explore something called the chip model, which is really, really handy. And we'll take a look at a, a toy theater emulator for that model as well. So let's start with the chip model. Um, the chip model really just uses uh, chips with different colored sides. And then one color represents a positive and then the other color represents a negative. So for example, this right here, three yellow chips represents positive three. And then on the other side of those chips, they'll be red. And the red represents a negative. So in this case, this would represent negative four. That's the idea. So this is a really handy model because you can clearly indicate which is positive and which is negative. Um, actually, let me go ahead and pull up, uh, pull up Toy Theater so you can take a look. So here's Toy Theater's implementation of this. And you can see the different colored chips right here. So what you can do is just drag things. There we go. So that would be like negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. And you can even drag these on here with this, with this model. You can say that this is negative four. There you go, stuff like that. And now we're gonna see what happens. So like what happens if you uh, add three? What answer do you get? Hmm. Well, we know the answer is supposed to be negative one but let's see if we can make sense of why that is. So let me go back to the slides. Okay. Uh, oh, oh yeah, so this is equivalent to what's called the charged field model. Um, it, it, basically, if you're in a rush or if you don't have time or if, if, you, if you, you, know, you need to just get it done really quickly, what you can do is you can instead use, actually, let me do it like this. I'll use green and red. You can use circles with pluses in them to represent positive numbers. So this would be like positive two. And then you can use circles with minuses or negative signs in them 
to represent negative numbers, just like that. So that's the charged field model. So same thing, except uh, maybe the colors are a little bit different and you're using pluses and minus signs, plus signs and minus signs. Um, yeah, okay, so now let's talk about zero. So this is what's really interesting about this model. Um, a gain of $2 can be canceled out by a $2 loss and that gives you a $0 change in finances. And we can model that with our chips and it's really, really straightforward. So here, each one of these pictures is modeling the number zero. So this right here, <laughs> there you go, that's zero. Because what, what you have right here is you've got a positive one, a positive one, and a negative one, and a negative one. So they cancel each other out. It looks kind of like a little face, right? They cancel each other out and you get zero. This also represents zero for the same reasoning, right? And this also represents zero. So anytime you have a pair of red and yellow chips, we call it a zero pair. So that's a term that you do want to know. You do want to know uh, the term zero pairs, because this is what lets us introduce students to one of the most important, uh, I'll say tricks in mathematics, which is adding zero. Um, yeah, so funny enough, uh, <laughs> if you look at all of the like really big mathematical proofs, they're, they almost always boil down to a couple little interesting tricks. One of them is adding zero. So like you add zero in a clever way. And the other one is multiplying by one. So you multiply by one in a clever way. And that lets you get a lot farther than you would imagine. Um, and we introduce students to this concept here when we first introduce them to negative numbers. So uh, let me give you an example here. Hmm, which one do I want to use? Actually, you know what? I don't want to take too much time. This is already going to get pretty long. Um, if you want to see me give you an example of this being applied in a later math class, like algebra, um, ask me and I'll do it during the collaboration meeting. Okay. All right. Um, but let's talk about addition. So now that we, now that we know what the model is, let's talk about how you would model addition. Um, well, we already know how to model addition <laughs> and the model is identical. The model is identical. So what you do is you have a collection of objects. There's three of them. And then here's a collection of objects. There's two of them. And then you bring them together and that will give you your addition. So here, actually, I think I might even have a yellow. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five. Cute. So that's it. So that's how you model addition. You do the same thing if your numbers are negative. So that's four, or sorry, this is negative four and this is negative three. So when you add those up, how many negatives do you have? You have seven of them, seven of those negative units. So that's negative seven. So you could do something like this, right? Let's go for red. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There you go. So that's how you would model it. Okay. Um, this is just, there's just some other pictures of it, uh, but this is where it gets fun. And this is what I was going to show you on toy theater. Uh, this right here is modeling. What is that? One, two, three, four, five plus three or negative five plus three, sorry, three plus negative five. And that gives you negative two. So you're getting negative two because what happens to these right here, they get wiped out. Those are all zeros. Those are zero pairs. And then you're left with negative two. There you go. So that's actually what I was just about to show you on toy theater. So let's take a look here. What I'll do up at the top is I'll put plus three, just to emphasize that I'm doing positive three. And then what's left over, there's just this little one. There we go. Because these all get canceled out. All right. So addition is actually really, really easy to model, really nice to model, right? Here's another example down here. Here you've got negative two plus six, and that's just gonna give you positive four. So it's really easy to see because these will cancel out. Okay, um, subtraction can be modeled nicely, but it's a little, uh, it's a little bit trickier. Let's take a look. Um, first, we gotta remember this, subtraction is always taking away. It's always taking from or taking away. So you have to actually show that action. And if you can't show that action with your model, then you're not modeling subtraction. So you gotta keep that in mind. You do need to be able to actually take something away. Okay, so let's try this here. Um, let's try to model these with using chips, okay? So I think, uh, yeah, I'll use the charged field model just so I have a little bit more um, digital control over the pictures. And I'm just gonna use my, uh, here we go, I'm just gonna use this highlighter. There we go, perfect. Okay, so let's do four minus three. That one's not too bad, right? 
Uh, let's do yellow. Okay, so four minus three would be one. Now that's too hard to see. For I'm gonna use green for positives. One, two, three, four. We've seen this before. And if you wanna take away three, you take those out. And then what you're left with is just one. Same idea, right? Seen that before. Okay. Now let's do negative five, take away negative two. That one's not too bad either. So what is it? Negative five, take away negative two. Well, we're gonna need negatives and we're gonna need five of them. One, two, three, four, five. So now if I take away negative two, what am I left with? I'm left with one, two, three, negative three. Oops. <laughs> there we go. That's the idea. Second here. <laughs> Trying to find a way. I forgot to turn off my notifications here. Just want to be sure that they don't get. Hmm. Well, that's all right. Oh, there we go. There we go. Nice. Okay. So where was I? Oh, yeah. Take away. So then you get negative three. All right. Let's see the next one. Uh, five, take away seven. Let's try to do that one. So that means we need to start with five objects. One, two, three, four, five. And we're going to take away seven. But you can already see there's a problem, right? How can I take away seven when I only have five? How can we get around this? Hmm. Think about it for a moment. We have to be able to take away seven, but we've only got five. How can we get seven in there without changing the value? Hmm. Hmm. Let's talk about it. Well, we don't have seven to take away but we can use one of the most powerful techniques in mathematics and we can add zero. So that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna add two zero pairs. Check this out. Let me go ahead and get some more here. What I'm gonna do is this, right? So here we had five, we had positive five. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add two zero pairs. Oops, there we go. Do a little dividing line here, there we go. So now I'm really just adding zero. That's all I've done here is I've added zero. Uh, this doesn't change the value because five plus one minus one plus one minus one is still five. But now I actually have seven to take away. And that's what I'm gonna do next. I'm gonna circle the seven and take it away, minus seven. And then what's left at the very end, I'll draw a little imply zero here. We're gonna have this, oops. One, two, negative two. Just like that. And that's the final answer. Pretty cool, huh? So it's, a, it's funny, but this little trick uh, of adding zero is really profound. And it really, really helps students understand things later on. And like I said, I can show you an example from algebra if you want to ask about it in the collaboration meeting. But that's pretty much the idea. So what I want you to do now is I want you all to try at home to do numbers four and five. See if you can do those ones on your own, all right? Or with your group, even better, right? If you're watching this together, try to do it together. All right, let's see. Uh, oh yeah, okay, so now we're gonna talk about the number line. So this is one of the nice ones that you can do in a classroom because it, there's a really nice kinesthetic model. But what we're basically going to do is talk about walking along a number line. And we're going to talk about walking forward or backward and what direction we're facing. So um, if I were in a classroom, I would physically show this to my students, right? No matter what age they are. And they really, really get a kick out of it. And it really helps cement the idea in their head. But what I'm going to do here is draw pictures instead. OK. <clears throat> so first, if we're doing addition, we face to the right. So that's what we're gonna do first. So it's kind of like, imagine this, right? Imagine you, you wanna add something. If you're gonna add, then what you do is you face to the, which way are you face? Yeah, face to the right, there we go. That's right, not mirrored for me. Yeah, so I'd face to the right if I'm gonna do addition. But if I wanted to do subtraction, then I would face to the left this way. That's the first thing. 
Um, and then if we're adding a positive number, we walk forward. So let me show you that. So let's say I'm doing addition. So I face to the right. And then if I'm adding a positive number, I would walk forward like so. Right? That's the idea. <laughs> um, if I were adding a negative number, I would walk backward instead. So I'm doing addition. I'm facing this way. And I'm going to add like, oh, negative two. Then I would walk backward <laughs> like that. That's the idea. Now, if we're doing subtraction, we face to the left instead. And then the rest is the same. If we're going to subtract a positive number, we walk forward. But if we're going to subtract a negative number, we walk backward. That's the idea. So essentially, uh, the, uh, the direction that you walk is determined by the sign of the number, right? So positive number, walk forward. Negative number, walk backward but the direction you're facing is determined by the operation, right? So face to the right, if you're doing addition, face to the left, if you're doing subtraction. So that's pretty much the idea. And we can even show that on a little number line here. Let's, uh, let's do an example. Let's say we wanna do, how about, here we go, we'll do five minus seven. Draw my little number line here. I'm gonna mark five on here. Four, three, two, one, zero, negative one, negative two, negative three, right? Okay, so here's how I would do it. Uh, I'm gonna start at five. Actually, this is one of those times where it's really great to have a number line on the floor of your classroom, just a number line that goes from like negative 10 to 10. It's really, really fun because you can have the kids stand on each number and then you can have them like walk backward and forward. It's really, really fun. Um, but I'll just draw a little figure here. Uh, we're gonna start at five. So let's see here, blue, because I like blue. There we go, we start at five. And then because we're subtracting, we're going to face to the left. So my little person here is gonna face to the left, right? And then because the sign of this number is positive, it's a positive number, we're gonna walk forward that many steps. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There we go. So then this person would be right here. There we go. And they would land on negative two. So the answer here is negative two, right? That makes sense, right? So that's kind of how you do it. Um, let's try, let's see. How about we do a different one? Let me erase some of these things here. Let's see, what could we try? Hmm, how about we do two plus negative four. Let's do that one. Let's do two plus negative four. Let me erase these little figures here. There we go. Okay. Now we're going to start on two. And then because we're adding, we're going to face to the right. So here's my little person here facing to the right. Uh, but now we're adding a negative number. See, now we're adding negative four. So this person's going to walk backward instead. They're going to go this way, four spaces. One, two, three, four. There we go. <laughs> Got to work on my sketches, right? Ah. <laughs> there we go. So that's the idea. And then we land on negative two. So the answer here is negative two. And that's the way that you would model it. So it's fun. You can try it, try it on your own in your own home. Try it with your siblings. If you have younger siblings, you can try it. It's fun. Okay. Uh, all right, so now we need to learn some technical details here before we talk about uh, multiplication. So first, this is one of the most important definitions you can know, and I'll explain why in a moment here. This definition carries so far through a student's mathematical understanding, all the way up into PhD level mathematics, this fundamental idea. Um, the absolute value of a number is its distance away from zero. So this is really all that you need to think about. It's the distance away from zero. That's what that is. And we denote it by this symbol here, the two bars, okay? So that's what that is. Now, because of that definition, this is an absolutely critical thing to understand. So this symbol right here is literally the distance between A and B. So this is something that you should base, you should almost like burn it into your brain that that's what that symbol means. No matter what numbers I put in here for A and B, if I have this symbol, it means the distance between them. 
So for example, let me do something like, uh, here we go. How about negative three minus two in absolute value? What is that? That's the distance between negative three and two, it's five. Because that's how many spaces apart those are. That's how many units apart negative three and two are. That's really all it is. That's really all it is. Um, let me think, do I have the thing about, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, well, I'll come to that in a minute. I got to see, I think I have that calculus example. Yeah, I do. Okay. Um, okay. And I'll explain why this is so important. Do you remember doing those problems in like algebra two, where you had to solve uh, equalities and inequalities with, uh, with absolute values? And it was a real, real pain. I'll give you an example. <laughs> I'm sure you'll remember it, or some of you will remember it a little bit once I draw an example. Um, something like this. X minus three equals x plus two, right? And the question was, you know, solve for x. And when you saw this, you were probably like, oh, because you have to break it up into, into four different cases. Yeah, you have to break it up into four cases. And then two of those cases end up being identical. And then you can toss them out. And then the other ones give you the two possible answers or something like that. But then one of them is extraneous and you got to toss it out. Anyway, it, it was a real headache, right? Well, what I want you to try at home is this. I want you to try to solve this problem, this x, this one right here. Try to solve that problem just by thinking about this definition. So try to say this out loud in words and then see if you can solve it. Let me throw let me throw the thinker up first and we'll go through we'll go through a cycle here. So think about what this means first. Okay, now I want you to say out loud what you think it means. So uh, what is that sentence, that mathematical sentence, say it out loud using this definition. Try that. Okay, and now try to write down your answer. See if you can use that, that intuition, that word, those words that you said out loud to write the answer down. Try it. Okay, now let's try to solve it together. So when I see this, what this is telling me is that the distance between x and three is the same as the distance between x and negative two. Yeah, so remember this is this minus negative two, a little bit smaller because I changed the size, right? So what this is telling me is that I'm looking for a number where it's distance away from three is the same as its distance away from negative two. So what does that really mean? It means it's the number that's directly between three and negative two. What number is that? Well, let's do a number line just to be fully edifying here. Okay, here's zero. Here's three, one, two, three. Here's negative two, one, two, three, right? Okay, and I just have to find the number that's exactly in the middle there. Can you see it? right here, 0 0.5. I didn't even I didn't even have to think about that, right? I even just drew the line. I was like, oh, it's gotta be right in the middle there. It's gotta be 0 0.5, that's pretty much it. That's how you solve that problem and now we're done. So this is why, uh, this is why this type of intuition and this type of knowledge is so powerful for students. And if they miss it, when they go into like the higher grades, middle school, high school, they're missing a whole bunch of mathematics that they really should know, the fun part about math. Now, uh, oh yeah, so there's also this little cute result. Um, we can write this as this, right? Because by definition, the absolute value of a number is its distance away from zero. So in other words, uh, this, or, sorry, this thing right here is the definition of, an, of absolute value. It's the distance between A and zero. So it agrees. Really cool, huh? Um, and so here's an example that students have to see in calculus and when I was teaching this, the, uh, I think it was the first time, uh, my students were really, really lost. And they were lost because of this. So in, in the first week of Calc 1, uh, they're introduced to this, a formal definition of a limit. Okay, And this is the definition. You don't need to know this. You don't need to memorize this. If you've never seen this before, don't feel bad. I'm just using this as an example of knowledge on the mathematical horizon. Right? This is where students are headed way down in the lower elementary grades. We have to think about where they're headed. They're headed here. 
and read this read this definition <laughs> like it, it's absolute it's, it's so hard to make sense it says a function f has the limit l at a point x equals a if for all epsilon greater than zero there exists a delta greater than zero such that if zero is less than the absolute value of x minus a and that's less than delta then f the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon and so <laughs> there you go you got all that hmm. makes sense right <laughs> um so well, i was teaching this to my students and we were talking about limits and there's actually a very 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 nice picture that goes along with this definition and i was drawing this picture and they were like totally lost. And I mean, every student would be lost at this, right? Like I was lost at this. Um, but the reason that I'm not lost at it anymore is because I recognize that this is just the distance between X and A. And this is just the distance between F of X and L, whatever they are. And I was sitting there talking to my students and they were all looking at me like, I have no idea what he's saying. <laughs> and then I was like, wait a minute. Have you all ever heard of this? As, as, has, has anybody ever said that this is the distance between those two numbers? And then, then I was like, how many of you have heard that this is the distance between X and A? And only like two of my students raised their hand. And I was like, whoa, oh man, that makes so much sense. That's why they didn't understand. Um, they were having a hard time following because when they saw this symbol and this symbol, they weren't thinking about distance. They were just thinking about absolute value of X minus A. They, they were only seeing the numerals, right? You have to make sense of what these symbols mean. So as a, I can actually explain this pretty intuitively now, um, if you think about this in terms of distance, right? So what this theorem, or sorry, what this definition is saying is that a function has a limit if, uh, if when the distance between X and A is very, very small, the distance between the output and the limit is also very small. That's what it means. So uh, as you get closer to the point A, uh, you get f of x gets closer to the point L. So as the, I should say this, as the input gets closer to that point A, the output gets closer to that point L. And that's all these are, distances. Just distances, that's all it is. Anyway, like I said, you don't need to memorize this or know this, but I just wanted to give you this example on the mathematical horizon. So we have to help help our students and set them up early on, all right? Okay, <laughs> yeah, there you go. This definition is complicated. It's virtually impossible to understand if they've not been taught to interpret that as a distance. Um, oh, here's a question. I want you to think about this for a moment. Um, is the absolute value of A minus B the same as the absolute value of B minus A? Hmm, what do you think? Well. What is this? That's the distance between A and B. And what is that? That's the distance between B and A. Is the distance between A and B the same as the distance between B and A on the number line? Yes. Yes, it is. Yes, it absolutely is. Notice that we didn't even need to like bring in any sort of manipulation or proofs or like, you didn't even need to plug in any numbers really. You could, but you really don't even need to. You just have to remember that that's a distance and that's it. So that's pretty cool. Uh, incidentally, if you wanted to see the rigorous mathematical proof, it's pretty straightforward. It's just like this. It's just missing a step on the inside. A minus B is equal to the absolute of negative B minus A. This is a little trick that you learn in uh, Algebra 2, actually. And then that's equal to the absolute value of B minus A. Why is that? Well, because this is the distance uh, this is the number, this is how far away B minus A, yeah, sorry, hold on, hold on, I'm getting, I'm getting ahead of myself. This right here <laughs> is how far away negative B minus A is from the origin, and this is how far away B minus A is from the origin, but they're opposites, so they're the same distance away. There we go. Anyway, I can explain that more if you'd like, but uh, just remember there that it's a distance. Um, okay, so this is this is what we've all been waiting for, right? Uh, if a and b are signed numbers, then a minus b is the same as adding negative b to a. This is the whole conversion, right? Negatives as pos as a, I'm sorry, right? Subtraction as adding a negative, right? That's what we're talking about here. Um, 
And now we can actually make sense of that. Now we can actually make sense of it. Uh, we're not going to prove it in this class. Uh, if you're intrigued by all of this and you want to study this stuff in more detail, you can take uh, Math 233. There is a Math 233 for um, math ed students, actually. And I think if you want to get, oh, I forget which degree. I know if you want to get a master's, you have to take at least 233. But Anyway, it's a fun class if you want to prove everything that you learned back in K-12 education, which I thought was really fun. Um, anyway, uh, oh yeah, I just want to emphasize that all the intuition that we're talking about is fully backed up by mathematical rigor. So if any of this seems, as we call, hand wavy, like, uh, just do that, uh, uh, it is actually backed up by mathematical rigor. And this is kind of a running theme in the course. We want students to have developed a comfortable and robust comprehension of these ideas so that the transition to abstraction is as easy as possible because it's very difficult for students to make that transition without the intuition behind it. Then it just becomes a game of pushing symbols. Uh, yeah, they'll struggle a lot more in advanced math courses. Okay, so, oh, technical details. We actually talked about this. Um, zero is the additive identity. Uh, we talked about additive inverses, so that's good. We know what that is. Additive inverses are uh, numbers where when you add them, you get zero. And let's talk about multiplication now. So we saw addition, we saw, uh, we saw subtraction, so now let's talk about multiplication. Now, students, this is, this is, students usually begin learning addition and subtraction of signed numbers in about fifth, sixth grade. They can get introduced to negative numbers earlier on, um, and we actually saw some students using them, I think it was uh, like third grade or maybe fourth grade. Yeah, anyway, anyway, um, multiplication and division comes a little bit later. And this is a good question that we're going to answer right now. So why is the product of two negative numbers positive? So you know how when you learn about signed numbers, you're like, okay, a positive times a positive is a positive, a positive times a negative is a negative. A negative times a positive is a negative, and a negative times a negative is a positive, right? In other words, like if you did this, negative 2 times negative 6, everyone's going to be like, that's 12. But why? Why is it that those negatives cancel out, so to speak, you know? Um, so it turns out that even up into the 1800s, people did not want to believe that this was actually how multiplication would work on negative numbers. Um, so how can we make students, uh, how, how can we help learners make sense of that in a convincing way, right? We don't just want to say it works that way because. That's not allowed, no. You, know, you, know, you never just say, oh, you, it's just because. We always have reasons. We always have reasons. We will always answer the question why, as long as we can. So um, what we can do is we can use the chip model and the repeated addition model of multiplication to model it. So I've got some examples here. Um, it's really quite easy. Uh, this is, for example, uh, 2 times 4. And it's just, you know, four sets of two chips, right? Right here. 1, 2, 3, 4. Do the same thing with uh, the negatives, right? So this is 2 times negative 4. And notice the answer is negative 8, right? There we go. And over here, the answer is 8. So we can see that. That's pretty easy, right? Another reason the chip model is handy. Um, we can also view it as the opposite of a product. And this is a fun model if you want something a little more kinesthetic, because basically what you do is you treat this thing like this. You do the operation and then change the sign, right? That only works if one of them is negative, though. One of them is negative. So we model 2 by 4 with chips or two times four, I should say, which is eight, and then flip those chips over. So actually, let me do that here. So here's how we would do it. Um, let me, yeah, okay, I'll use green. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is eight. And then what we do is we just flip them all over. Just like that. And now we have negative 8. So that's a really easy one to show. Um, da, da, da. Oh, yeah. And then, and then you can also do the same thing on a number line using the kinesthetic model that we talked about earlier, the one where I was like walking backward and walking forward. It's the same idea because multiplication is repeated addition, right? So you can just do the exact same thing again. Um, so try to, do, try to do this at home. It doesn't take too long, but I just want you to actually like try it once to see what it feels like. Um, do the opposite of a product model. So start by modeling 
three times four and then flip the chips. And then start by modeling three times three and then flip the chips. So try that out for a moment. Okay, let's move on. So yeah, we know that a positive times a positive is a positive because our models from earlier actually showed that, right? Models and arguments above. Um, we just saw that a positive times a negative is a negative and a negative times a positive is a negative because of commutativity, right? Um, but what about negative times a negative? Hmm. Well, consider the following patterns. This is one way to explain it to students. Check this out. Okay, four times two is eight. Three times two is six. Two times two is four. One times two is two. Zero times two is zero. So negative one times two has got to be what number? Well, if the pattern is to continue, then we should end up with negative two, right? And then if we continue again, we should end up with negative four. So there we go. That's one way of, a, let me actually highlight that, <laughs> negative two, negative four. So that's one way of showing a student that that's where the negative products would lead you. So if you had, um, uh, so you can see that it's like repeated subtraction, right? Or I should say, uh, you could almost say, um, yeah, yeah, this, this is just repeating subtraction. Okay, so now look at the next column. Look at this one over here. Okay, so if we did negative four times four, we know that that's negative 17. Negative four times three, or sorry, negative 16. Negative four times three is negative 12. Negative four times two is negative eight. Negative four times one is negative four. Negative four times zero is zero. Negative four times negative one is what? Well, if the pattern is to continue, the answer should be four. And then similarly, negative four times negative two, the answer would have to be eight if the pattern were to continue, right? So that's kind of what's going on here. Negative four, negative four, negative four, negative four. <gasps> but then what? Or actually, I'm sorry, not negative. That's actually adding. There we go. Adding four. Plus four, plus four, plus four. There it goes. Pretty cool, huh? So this is usually, an, oh yeah, the pattern suggests that. Um, this is usually enough to convince learners of the fact it's not technically a rigorous argument. I mean, we didn't really prove anything. What we did was we saw a pattern and we continued the pattern. That's what we did there. Okay. Um, yeah, so here is the theorem. The theorem says, if the signs of the two numbers are the same, then the product will be positive. If the signs of the two numbers are different, then the product will be negative. That's the idea. So positive times a positive is a positive. Negative times negative is a positive, but if they differ, you'll have a negative result. Okay, so let's see a, a proof. Um, I, I have proof in quotes because it's not technically a proof because it's not fully complete because um, we're making some assumptions about these numbers. And if we wanted to have a complete proof, we would not be able to make those assumptions. But I think for our argument here and for our own edification, this should be fine. So we're just going to suppose first that we have two positive numbers. That's what we're gonna suppose first. Then we know that the opposite of those numbers must be negative, and that's just by definition. If A is positive, then negative A is negative, right? Now, we know this is true. So negative A times zero is zero, but we can be clever <laughs> and we can write zero as B plus negative B. Then we can use the distributive property to distribute negative A to each of these terms right here. And zero is just staying zero on this side for now, right? Now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add negative AB to both sides. Or I'm sorry, add, um, add AB to both sides. I'm sorry, add A times B to both sides. So I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say plus A times B plus A times B. And then I get this. And that's the result. So now we know that negative A times negative B has to be positive because we know that A times B is also positive. There we go. So A is greater than zero and B is greater than zero. So A times B is greater than zero. So negative A times negative B is greater than zero. So there you go. So this proof is, uh, is all right, but it's not, it's not technically very rigorous. Uh, for one, um, we're kind of assuming what we were trying to prove. So in some senses, it's a circular argument, right? 
but we can make sense of this because we know what multiplying two positive numbers looks like, and you always get a positive number. Actually, will you? That's a good question. If I take two positive numbers, will I always get a positive? Yeah, well, that's what we were kind of trying to prove here. So anyway, this is not the greatest proof, but I think this is enough to convince uh, a more advanced learner that it should be true. Okay. Um, oh yeah, and since we chose these arbitrarily to be any positive numbers, it holds for, for all numbers. Okay. Um, all right, so now let's talk about dividing sign numbers. Now that we've established all the rules for multiplying integers, it's easy to extend them for division by using the missing factor model of division. So uh, remember this, if A, B, and C are real numbers, and B is not zero, right? Because you can't divide by zero. Then we say that C divided by B is equal to A if and only if A times B is equal to C. Whoa, okay, okay, wait, what? Recall? Like I'm supposed to know what's going on, right? Forget all this stuff. <laughs> um, it's easier if we can say it in words. So let's try to put some words to this. What I'm saying, this, this equation, or sorry, this sentence up here, that's the same as saying this. If B goes into C A times, then B A times is C. So let me try using some numbers. If five goes into 30 six times, then five six times must be 30. That's what this is saying right here. So that, uh, that sentence that I highlighted here, this is saying this. And this is one of the reasons it's so important to understand these definitions and these meanings of things, right? Because what we're saying here is if B goes into C a certain number of times, then if you repeated B that many times, you would get C. That's the idea. Um, so here's what I want you to do now. At home, I want you to think about this for a minute and uh, think about what these are saying. Okay, now try to say them out loud. Say out loud what that sentence means and uh, try to say this out loud. Remember, to yourself, to the wall, whoever, but actually speak it out loud so that your brain can hear it coming out of your mouth. See if it makes sense. All right, now let's move along. I think we're just about done here. Uh, yeah, there we go, let's play. Again, thanks for bearing with this long lecture. Um, the reason this one is so long is because we learned all about sign numbers and then all the models for all four of the operations, basically. Um, so let's play. Let's take a look at activity 10A here. It's going to be similar to what we've seen in the lecture. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. This is a really, really fun. This is one of my favorite questions, actually. Um, so here, there's a, I'm giving you a number line right here. And then based on this number line, you have to determine if these statements on the left are true or false. And I would recommend thinking about the definition. That's the best thing I can say. Think about the definition of those things. So that's a fun problem. Um, then you've got some problems where you're just using the chip model to model some operations. And then using the opposite of a product with chips. And then, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm chips or a charge field. Yeah, that's it. So that's not too bad of an activity. It's pretty straightforward. All right. So the next thing is uh, lecture 10B. So let me go ahead and uh, say bye one, one almost second to last time, I suppose, with these lectures. Uh, yeah. So thanks again for hanging in there and I'll see you next time.